might be getting a delivery. Yeah. It's that. Good morning to uh, everybody already here. People be waiting. Here we go. Let's see if I can move this close ish to my face. And uh, yeah, uh, for everybody who's here, you're gonna you're gonna be in the know first. Now we're not gonna answer anybody else's questions about it. Uh, you might see a few people walking around in the background. That is for a uh, new web video happening now. It's gonna be the season finale of two. season season two. Season two. Season two of Will of Fear, and we've got our minions going head to head. They are getting some stuff going. A little bit off camera over there, so you may or may not see them wandering around. Yeah, but probably make a lot of noise and just be distracting. Yeah, you're quiet. I'm quiet. Better, worse, better, worse. Maybe. Uh, Let's see the pads on. I might have. Let's see that's plugged in. Good to go. Here we go. Musical chairs. Will be. The fan was on. All right. Yeah, it should be better. All right. Let me know if we're all sounding good now. Ooh. Super excited to be brewing while listening to you guys. Also, hello from Wisconsin. Uh, sell a, se send us some new Glarus. Uh, yes. I, <coughs> I mean, at least one spotted cow, because apparently that's what you're supposed to do. But also, tasty things. Yeah, all the sours and stuff like that. Matt uh, Doogie sent me some new Glarus once when he was over there. Sounds like my volume's good. Awesome. Delicious stuff. Right. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody, to the Sunday morning live stream that we do every single Sunday at 845 Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we've got some Hunter Hunter going on in the background over there that you guys can't see, So, but if my eyes divert, you know why. Um, the, if you haven't tuned in before, the kind of format that we go over is some general genus news, things that are going on here. Then we jump into a beer of the week, and that is where we break down a style. Um, BJCP wise kind of let you know what fits into the style and then give you our favorite malts hops and yeast to use within that style and then we go into two discussion topics which today we're gonna be talking about some roasted malts all the roasted malts that we know about and their, their flavor differences and why you would use different roasted malts um, and then we're gonna be talking about uh, how yeast can add sweetness to beer just a couple different ways that yeast adds sweetness to beer um, so you have a better understanding of how that works yeah and and a very last special topic that's going to be a surprise. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, there you go. And yeah, I mean, we could trade you some Halcyon for it, but that would probably be in the form of beer because that's where most of ours is. That's true. All our Halcyon goes into there. In, I actually need to get some more ordered. We do. Uh, juicy IPAs generally. I love it in juicies. Still really nice, light, big, and delicious. Ah, I digress. Speaking of juicies, that, I believe that's uh, what one of the two contestants is currently using. Uh, Ooh, sneak in the, peek. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. In their in their wib attempt. Um, yeah. Today's a, yeah. it's gonna be a fun day. We've got a lot of videos that are going on. Um, so besides the fact that we're doing a Willet beer, um, we're going to try to get out a uh, how seltzer nutrients or you know, how nutrients in general work video done today. Um, I know Tim and Ryan have a barrel. Um, we'll uh, do a, a pretty basic uh, barrel care, and uh, mostly about uh, re-swelling and uh, sanitizing. Um, some little bit of care tips in there, not super in depth, but uh, something if you've acquired your new barrel and you don't know why it's leaking all over your floor type of thing. That'll be good for everybody to have. Uh, we got a Belgian Dark Strong on tap. I don't know if we mentioned it before. It's been on tap for a couple of weeks, but I don't know if we put it out in the live stream. So just letting everybody know. There's a really yeah. delicious Belgian Dark Strong on. Uh, it is delicious. Get a lot, little bit more uh, cherry than your classic like fig date but super fruity and awesome and Get it's, got, some. it's uh 13 i think it's got the perfect amount of sweetness for that 13 percent too yeah. so 
uh yeah we got that and then uh patio season's coming up we finally have got a week of 65 to 70 degree weather um that we're gonna have this next week and so we're excited to get that patio um ripping and roaring and get some chairs out there and uh people sitting and enjoying the weather that'll be nice and a few good patio beers i think we even have a a grisette coming up specifically for that yeah that'll be super tasty uh and then we've already got our uh our pilsner um it's a good patio beer. Pilsner's so. on tap. We're doing a grapefruit IPA. That's our new uh, Shell 77 beer. We partner with uh, the uh, some local, uh, what is it, the 96th uh, D refueling squad out, out at the uh, Air Force and make some beer for them. So that's fun. Yeah. Grapefruits are always delicious in summer. It, it, it is. So that's, right. uh, that's it for the Genus Brewing News, things that are going on here, which means it's time for our Beer of the week, bum bum bum. Beer of the week, bum yeah. And today's beer of the week is going to be a uh, sweet stout, kind of inspired uh, pastry stout. It's going to fall into the same category. So when I'm going over these, uh, we're going to be thinking pastry stout, but it should fit into the category of sweet stout, uh, or maybe even uh, imperial sweet stout, since a lot of uh, pastry stouts are like eight to nine percent. Um, there's not a technical category that they really slide into really well. So well, I think uh, pastry stout, uh, pastry stouts are sweet, so it goes right in there. The sweet stout. Yeah. I mean, that, that's where it sits in my mind. That's what I would classify our imperial cereal stout as yeah the count chocula is definitely yeah. in that uh, uh sweet stout maybe pastry stout but it's just above that abv guideline so yeah that's um, why it's a guideline exactly uh sweet stouts are a uh, very dark sweet full-bodied slightly roasty ale that can uh you know give you notes of coffee or even uh, some cream some lactose kind of notes in there um, and a lot of times if you're going the pastry stout route they're also flavored with things like vanilla um, sometimes some fruit flavors some other baking kind of flavors yeah, uh, we flavor ours with a Count Chocula cereal. Um, I've seen a bunch of them out there with a whole bunch of different things. Uh, we are actually going to take on that in a pastry white stout with some pistachio. Mm-hmm. That's going to be really good. I'm excited uh, for that. Any aroma on there? I mean, you're going to get some uh, mild roasted grains, a little bit of coffee and chocolate, but you're not going super, super deep into the smoky range like black malt. Impression should be cream-like sweetness. I mean, it should be thick and sweet in your mouth. That doesn't necessarily always mean sugary sweet. I mean, you could get that sweetness from like salted caramel or an impression of sweetness from vanilla, but it should be thick bodied and sweet uh, in your in the aroma. Yeah, and it does say cream-like sweetness, so you mm-hmm. definitely want that cream in your mouth uh, uh, with this style. Exactly. Uh, lactose does help with that or alternative cream sources if you have them. Like yeah. maybe something like Oh, oat milk. Yeah. <laughs> oat milk being the new uh, popular thing that uh, is being used these days. Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't have too much diacetyl and hops really aren't too appropriate in this unless you're using something like uh, you have very, very oaky hop or things like that. But still just keep it extremely low. Hops should not be your main flavor component. Uh, and then uh, just to kind of reiterate, when going back to the flavor, uh, on the flavor, these should lean uh, on the sweet side, so they be, should be balanced toward the sweet side, meaning the roast character isn't going to come across uber aggressive. It's not going to be a very roasty like an American stout or a dry stout or even like a foreign extra stout. Um, <laughs> that roast is going to be um, su- subdued in re- relative to the sweetness of the beer. Yeah. Uh, Count Drunkula, a Cornish pastry stout. That could be a really interesting uh, whip right there. Just get some Cornish pastries for... All right, you're giving uh, us ideas. I feel like I need, uh, uh, you know, some actual like breakfast. Uh, what's that? Uh, scrapple. Scrapple. Ah oh, man, actually, uh, Dogfish Head Scrapple beer was pretty good. I enjoyed that one. Yeah, it's tasty. It's tasty. Uh, uh, some vital right. statistics. Uh, this thing is going to start out. Uh, if you're completely within the style guidelines, it's going to start out between 10.44 and 10.60, and finish between 10.12. And 1024 giving you an ABV of four to six percent. Again, that's just a guideline. Uh, we're kind of going in the overall flavor realm. Uh, mm-hmm. Almost every pastry style, if we're going in that pastry style that I know of, comes in close to eight percent. Most of them are going to be a lot bigger. And um, I think that might honestly uh, be to where pastry stouts developed. Uh, sweet stouts uh, more commonly being found, uh, you know, in England um, in that type of area. And Americans being Americans, we're like, why don't we make this bigger and uh, throw some more flavors in there? You're it's welcome, kind of, world. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you are welcome, 100%. But uh, uh, Battery is low. Uh, um, seeing, uh, Ryan, I thought you set up the camera. Nope. You, we, put, we you, didn't put the, you didn't put the. Oh. 
the hey make a permanent battery guy, happen thing in there this guy who hired him all right i don't know um, we'll uh but anyway we'll being, see if that gets changed and if uh we're end up being purple after that <laughs> uh being that uh, past, uh pastry stouts really are something that developed in the american craft brewing scene we absolutely love to make big boozy beers it does make sense that most pastry stouts are high alcohol yeah uh, and rest assured guys when uh, the camera inevitably goes out we will still be volumed so you'll be able to hear us but not see us for a hot second and then uh, hopefully when we come back we're not purple um mm. uh moving on to well uh you got uh, some uh, statistics in there uh, characteristic ingredients in this now pastry stouts let's first talk about the sweet stouts and what you're normally seeing in sweet stouts and then kind of where you can go on pastry stouts yeah so most sweet stouts are going to have some lactose uh, in there or they can have lactose it's not necessary um, but basically any sort of non-fermentable sugar to assure that this thing finishes with residual sweetness and that sweetness is indicative of sugar it's not just uh it's not just malt you know big fluffy Flutters. malt sweetness yeah uh, you, uh, along with that, adding things in uh, adjuncts in there to make them bigger, puffier, sweeter. Oatmeal will probably be a pretty common one in there, but you don't want to overdo it and take it into an oatmeal stout. Uh, a trick that I've seen all the time is taking some flaked oats and then actually toasting them until they give you a very nice oatmeal cookie type of flavor coming out of it, which is also going to enhance that pastry stout type of thing. Yeah, you get a little extra Maillard reaction off of actually physically toasting the oats, mm -hmm. uh, which is super helpful. And uh, 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 the oats will also provide kind of an oily slickness, which when combined with the Maillard reaction gives you that, uh, that's what gives you that cookie kind of flavor. Yeah, um, the, we are purple. Uh, Count Drunkula, this is actually something to point out uh, in that. Um, it tastes really nice and chocolatey as a wart, but as soon as your sugars are fer fermented out, you lose all the chocolatiness. And that's actually a pretty common thing. I mean, uh, it, tasting cocoa powder definitely doesn't taste like chocolate. It is super bitter and aggressive because you don't have all the sugars in there to back it up. Exactly. So that's why it's important to add things like lactose, maybe monk fruit. And actually, actually vanilla is, is an amazing thing to add to bring out chocolatiness. If you want a true a chocolate, chocolate flavor, flavor, you need a good, good vanilla, vanilla to bring, bring it out and boost that, that flavor. flavor. As well as, well as, as it adds a perceived sweetness, sweetness, sweetness in there and keep it into, into that, that chocolate realm and out, out of the roast realm. Exactly. exactly. So, uh, we're, we're building the entire concept of the beer uh, from the bottom up uh, and not just hitting those notes that you think you, you, you want to hit. For example, the cocoa powder. Yeah. Uh, Steve, that's actually a good question. How, how toasted toast did you make the oats? That's kind, kind of a personal, personal thing, thing in all honesty. Uh, most of the time going into pastry stouts, you're taking them to an oatmeal cookie point where you're trying to get most of the sweet, good flavors coming out of there and really express those oils. Uh, as far as what it actually is, I'm probably sure that somebody uh, has a number out there for it. How you do it at home is you take a whole bunch of oats and you basically toast them in your oven at a very, very low degree. Turn them every couple of 15 minutes and you can smell it. You can see the difference too. They'll turn into a really nice golden color, but it'll go from oatmeal to oats to oatmeal cookies and once it's at that oatmeal cookie point especially in sweet stouts and pastry stouts that's what you're looking for and uh, it smells like you're baking cookies there's no mistaking it uh, uh, as far as, far as, as the technical, technical standpoints, standpoints I'm, I'm sure, sure somebody, somebody has, has one, one you can get some laser guns, guns out, out and you know really test things and get after it but uh most of the time your face knows the best when it looks that perfect golden color when it smells like oatmeal cookies away you go that's right um, all right, so let's jump into our favorite malt hops and weeks, uh, and malt hops and yeasts for this style. Uh, for uh, favorite malt, I went with uh, Carafa 3. Uh, Carafa 3, we talked about before, not getting that overly roasty note in the beer. You don't want to overassert the uh, the roast character. And so Carafa 3 is a really nice way to have that debittered, roasted character. You get all the base flavor of roasted malt, but you can kind of uh, micro adjust what you want in terms of the, the color without adding too much of that roast flavor. I absolutely, absolutely love, love Carafas. Uh, uh, they're my favorite, favorite darkening, darkening malts out there. Out there it doesn't, doesn't go, go again, it doesn't go over roasted, roasted, doesn't get into the bitter realm. realm. Overusing some black malts can get you into the smoky realm, realm almost, and that is entirely inappropriate for, for this. Carafa is going to be amazing for it. You, you especially want it in pastry styles because you want your ingredients to shine. You want your Turn down the audio from the camera. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah and, and, and it's, it's good for a whole bunch of uh, other things out there. there. Drunk he was, was saying that he used some carafa uh, in uh, uh, Vienna. And, and, I mean, just a tiny little touch in there, if you don't have access to other ingredients, is pretty darn awesome. It's a great versatile malt that needs to be used more. Yeast of the week for this is the Fuller Strain. This is one of my personal favorite yeasts. Uh, is most commonly associated with ESBs, being that Fuller's, you know, is famous for ESBs. Yep. Uh, it, what is it? Imperial calls it pub. It is called ESB strain. London ESB and Y yeast, yeah. I think uh, it's just called English Ale. It's, it's WLP002 and Y yeast. Or White yeast, Labs, I mean. White Labs. Yeah. Um, this is an awesome, awesome yeast. It's super strong fermenter. It gives you some really good fruity flavors coming out of there. Some, I mean, it's indicative of ESB fruity flavors coming out of that. Extremely strong flocculent uh, on that. And that is actually one thing you do have to be aware of. If yeah. you get this beer <laughs> up into the higher degrees of alcohol, you are going to have to be aware that the Fuller strain likes to drop out early. So a lot of times we recommend if you're going super high alcohol, we're going we're going to recommend co-pitching. Um, but uh, basically just using something to keep that yeast in suspension as well as making sure that you have a nice yeast starter is going to help a ton. But when this yeast is done right, it's one of the best tasting mm. yeasts out there. Uh, definitely. I absolutely love this strain. Yeah. It should be used for far more things than it is. Um, hop of the week, we went with Warrior. Uh, we talked about this earlier on in the style guideline, but this is one of those uh, beers that you have a decent amount of bitterness. I think we're coming in at uh, 20 to 40 IBUs, but you really yeah. don't want to be tasting those IBUs through in any sort of hops. And so I like to use a really high alpha hop that I can kind of just adjust into the IBU range that I want and really not have a lot else going on. Warrior is perfect for that. I think uh, Magnum would also be really darn awesome for that. You want a hop that basically isn't going to add very much to mm. it because, again, in a pastry style, you're looking to get all of your flavor coming from the pastry that you're adding in or the pastry flavors that you're adding in. The hops just should balance out the overtly sweetness with a touch of bitterness. Exactly. And a lot of you are mentioning that we should uh, – um, uh, chastise at very least uh, Ryan so let me know if you guys want me to pull Ryan in so you guys can yell at him through the screens yeah <laughs> it's you know <laughs> he's here early and he didn't plan to be so, oh no he did plan know. he woke up here you, wow <laughs> oh then you should be well rested <laughs> I don't even want to yeah. talk about we, that uh, right now. To get, that, to get our will of beer done before uh, we get into the busy part of the day, we made sure that we um, started early. So we started at 6 a.m., which is about five hours earlier than Ryan's used to waking up. And uh, so we had to come in and you know, his, his brain don't work for a hot second. Yeah, you know, it, it takes a second to get going. His hamster has at least made it to the wheel, but maybe not running yet. Yeah, his hamster is sleeping on the wheel. Man. Hey, it's there. It's on the wheel, and every once in a while, the Twitch does make <laughs> it move. Hamster, take the wheel. That's uh, going to be a new song. Someone write that song if you're musically inclined. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, pastry stout. Where we at on that? We got through the uh, hops. Extra ingredients. I mean, this this guy is kind of uh, open up and out to the world. Uh, just kind of make sure when you're making a pastry stout account for the ingredients that you're adding in mm -hmm. um if you are adding trying to make you know a dark chocolate scone stout um sounds pretty you, good it actually <laughs> does somebody make that yeah but someone's uh, thinking uh, breakfast <laughs> but I, I, I am i am uh, but uh, if you're making something like that, you're adding in the dark chocolate for bitterness. And so you may not need as much hops in there, or you may need to soften up some of your malts to account for some of that bitterness in there. Uh, as well as, you know, other things, just always be aware of what ingredients you're adding in and how you do need to adjust for those in your malt and hop builds. Yeah, you're working backwards from the final flavor. Uh, and so that's going to be a subtractive kind of methodology as you're building out your recipe, uh, not additive. So you're not kind of being like, oh, I need this. And so that's going to go in there. I need this. And so that's going to th go there. You start with your characteristic flavors. You've got your with the scone example. Um, you've got your chuck. What is that sound? That sounds like it's next door. They might be doing some work. Oh, tell them to stop. Yeah. Um, 
uh, so yeah, you've got your chocolate, you've got your whatever bread flavor, your sugar flavors, um, and then you're kind of working back from there. Uh, added ingredients are going to be things like uh, maybe brown sugar if you want a little bit of that kind of molassesy sweetness mm -hmm. um, in your final product. Um, obviously, vanilla is going to help carry forward any chocolate notes. Um, you have all those, and so then work backwards with your base ingredients. If you have all the flavors you need from all of the extra stuff you're adding, you really need to simplify your grain bill as much as possible to make sure that you're not overcomplicating the beer. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, you know, uh, but it, in the example of the uh, pistachio white stout in there, the pistachio is actually uh, gives you a very, very big impression of sweetness. So for that, oh, it was the microwave. Mm. Mm. Can we call Ryan, it fix the microwave. Mustachio pistachio? Mustachio pistachio, yes. yes. <laughs> no, that, uh, definitely done <laughs> for honor of Zags as well. Yeah. As this glorious, glorious thing. Uh, but I was in a 1970s porn a couple weeks ago, yeah. so that's why this is here. Uh, adding that, it adds a very big impression of sweetness, so we may not need to add as much uh, vanilla, or we may not need to add the lactose in it. So Be aware of your ingredients, compensate for them, have that idea in your mind when you start out. Don't just take a box of pastries and chuck them into a beer that you built a recipe without even knowing what pastries you bought. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we've done that, but... But it's don't. not the best way to do it. It is a way, but maybe not the best. Do as I say and not also as, as I, I do. <laughs> Unless you're on web and then, you know, just go for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jason Palmer, Peter stick to making beer and not music. Um, agree to disagree. So music career is starting tomorrow. Watch mm. out for it. <laughs> definitely. Follow I mean, me on Spotify. We definitely. <laughs> he has a piano in here. I, have I mean, a piano. it's an electric one, but it's in here. Yeah, so. I'm not gonna say I play it, but I, I had it, but you it, it exists play it in quite here. often. Yeah, I, I mean, play. I, you, I play on it. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's better. That's better. All right, topic one. Let's do some roasted grains and what they do. Roasted grains are a really fun topic because they're uh, there's the common ones that pretty much everyone knows about. There's your chocolate malt, your roasted barley, and your black malt. You see those in a lot of different recipes. Um, so we'll talk about those, but then there's a lot of other fun roasted malts that we can go into and kind of give you a rundown of why and when we would use those different roasted malts. All right, so first, kind of uh, your basic grouping that everybody uses, most everybody knows about, chocolate, roasted barley, black malt. Um, so it means these actually, especially like roasted barley and black malt is an example of how the process of roasting is done in a couple of different ways. Uh, if I'm not mistaken on that, roasted bar or no, black the difference between well, black, yeah, uh, between black malt and roasted barley, um, they both go into a high temperature kiln, but ma uh, roasted malt will go into uh, that kiln uh, when it's dried, whereas roasted barley will go in as green barley, meaning it's still wet. Um, that does a couple different things. That roasted malt, uh, or the black malt, will go in there. Um, it creates a little bit of a smokiness and a little bit more of an earthiness uh, in the base malt, whereas a roasted barley is going to be more of that dry, sharp bitterness. Yeah, and great examples of this that I can think of, especially is American stout. Mm -hmm. American stouts are almost smoky, and that's 100% indicative of that black malt. But then if you're going for something for like a robust porter, which almost has the same degree of roastiness in there, but it's a much softer roastiness, and you're not getting those big burnt uh, acid notes in there that are really good in the American big old bold stout yeah so basically that uh, that roasted barley is going to give you some color it's going to give you that uh, that black cup of coffee note and not a lot of that middle kind of almost smoky almost meatiness whereas the black uh, malt is going to give you a similar if not the exact same amount of that kind of roasted coffee note um, but it's going to have a little bit more of that middle that uh, that kind of smokiness um, and you can definitely tell the difference yeah. um, so that is roasted barley and black malt uh, black malt by the way if you see black uh, patent same thing um, so chocolate malt uh, comes in at about 350 love a bond uh, on average, uh, whereas roasted barley and black come between 450 uh, and 525. Um, so 350 is pretty common. I've seen it up to 400 for chocolate malt. But the characteristic note of chocolate malt is it actually has kind of a powdery taste in the final product um, that makes you think chocolate. Uh, it's almost the difference between dark chocolate <coughs> and coffee, both extremely similar in that. But in the chocolate malt, you're going to get far more uh, reminiscent flavors of the, that dark chocolate roastiness. That's almost coffee, but not quite there. 
Um, everyone, real quick, give this video a thumbs up and then comment your favorite, uh, um, favorite brand of chocolate and then let us know why it's Dove. Um, so when you go a step down from chocolate malt, if you want, let's say you want a little bit of that color adjustment, a little bit of that powderiness that kind of tastes like cocoa, uh, but you don't want a lot of bold or a lot of roast flavor behind it. Um, and I see this used a lot in ambers. I see it used a lot in browns just to kind of color adjust, uh, but pale chocolate, pale chocolate comes in at around 220 to 250 level bond. Uh, and that's a really good one that you can play around with in your big dark beers, but also in something like an amber. Yeah, uh, pale chocolate. Uh, I've also seen use that if you don't want to co quite go into the huge dark roastiness, or if you're actually trying to achieve something closer to a milk sweet chocolate, pale chocolate is a great alternative because of the lighter roast. You don't quite get so deep and dark into it. Uh, of course, you're going to have to add other things to get into the milk chocolate realm. But yeah. that's a great adjustment if you're you making something like a sweet stout using a pale chocolate instead of a full chocolate malt. Because trying to cut out a lot of that burnt roastiness uh, can be really helpful. Yeah. Um, Black Prince malt uh, is one of two of Breeze's malts uh, that we have on here. Uh, Black Prince malt is a proprietary malt made by Breeze um, that is basically a roasted barley that has been dehusked prior to the roast process. Um, and so they are trying to get into that kind of carafa world where they are, uh, they are debittering. Um, uh, the malt. Uh, by removing the husks, you get a lot less of the astringency that comes from the roast process, uh, meaning it is a debittered malt. Uh, and Black Prince specifically is, uh, it's, it's really neutral. It doesn't have a lot of flavor behind it. Yeah. Um, I, especially on the night, I mean, you hear Black Prince, Black Patent, assuming it'll be, you know, a de-husk something similar. And it's not quite that. Yeah, I, it, I won't necessarily say less complex than some of the Carafas, but it is more neutral and forgiving than especially the darker Carafas, like Carafa 3. Yeah. Uh, Black Prince is a great thing to use if you want to add darkness to any beer or color to any beer without really adding too much in the background there. Uh, that makes it a really good choice for something like a black IPA uh, or even just like a dry stout or any, uh, you know, a lighter beer that doesn't have a lot of body to back up. Or if you want to focus on something that's not the malt flavor, you want to focus more on the hot flavor, but you want to get that color. Yeah. Uh, or if you're out of other things, adding it into a lighter beer, uh, it's, you know, some reds can take just a <coughs> touch of that black brins, uh, especially some of the darker reds. If you want a little bit more roast to it, um, great, great thing to add in. Um, going on to another debittered malt from Brees. Uh, this is a malt that they made uh, to kind of give you another option if you don't want to add that uh, roast mm. astringency, but want to be able to color adjust and add flavor to your beer. Uh, and that's Midnight Wheat. Uh, the biggest reason that Midnight Wheat is something that I use a lot less than something like Black Friends is because Midnight Wheat does have a little bit of that uh, black malt style uh, kind of uh, smoky uh, earthiness. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to go on this, Drunkula, because we almost answered it. Black Prince does add a little bit of redness, but not quite the same quality of redness that, say, Carafa would. Mm -hmm. uh, Carafa has a deeper red to it, where Bla Black Prince will be that kind of uh, ruddy red um, in there. All right. So Midnight Wheat, yeah. Uh, the way that it's roasted on that, you get a little bit more smokiness coming out of there. Definitely not to the quality of uh, black patent on it, but it's good for things that you want a touch. You want a little bit of dark roasted, almost fruity flavors coming out of it, but you don't want to quite go full smokiness of black malt. Yeah. Um, going on to another wheat strain uh, that's roasted quality or has uh, is made like a roasted malt. Uh, we have chocolate wheat, which chocolate wheat, the one that we carry is from Wireman. Mm. And that's a really unique one. I like using it in a lot of dark beers that have a natural fruitiness to them because uh, chocolate wheat by itself as a malt actually has some malt fruitiness to it. And so it's a little bit softer and a little bit uh, rounder without being that direct roast dark coffee kind of flavor. No, it, it's a pretty awesome malt actually i mean he pretty much described it right there uh and in fruitiness i mean it, that's not hop fruitiness going in there this is something a little bit different it's almost like uh charred fruit yeah uh, not charred charred is the wrong word yeah but it's not like, like burnt fruit grilled fruit, not gr it ex the the fruitiness is extended seared sure 
the fruitiness is accentuated by the fact that it's roasted. Yeah. And it, com it comes out in a weird way. It's a really hard one to describe, but there's a subtle fruitiness that uh, I like to use it like a, I think a tropical stout is kind of the perfect yeah. Oh, yeah. natural progression of that. It's a, uh, like almost if you're making uh, baked peaches or poached pears or something yeah. like that. You're not adding a direct char to it, but it has that really nice, rich, cooked, caramelized fruit to it. Yeah, so, so. try out some chocolate wheat if you have not Definitely. already. Uh, roasted rye, that's the next one we got. And that one is, that one's unique because it's like, it's spicy and it's it kind of tastes burnt to me, but it's an aggressive malt. Yeah, it, it is an extremely aggressive malt. Rye is aggressive to start out with. That is a very unique and uh, particular flavor that I think is awesomely delicious that people just don't make good rye beers because they don't understand it enough. And then people think rye sucks because they're drinking bad beer. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that, you, you know, rye is awesome. It is an awesome, awesome malt, but it is aggressive. And then you take that and you roast it, and you're really enhancing a lot of those deep spices. That's um, When rye gets spicy and you hear it, oh, no, I'm all right for that now. I can't eat eggs, actually. Thank you. Because Tim is broken. Yeah, eggs don't agree with me. And then my daughter also barfed a whole bunch of eggs everywhere yesterday and mm. so it's still a little uh yeah anyway uh so uh when you're roasting that when you're uh roasting these things you're actually expressing some of those oils and it becomes far far more aggressive on that super duper earthy spices coming out of it so if you're using roasted rye just keep that in mind use it at a very low amount from what you would normally use a uh, roasted malt for chocolate rye Chocolate rye. All right. So like we've talked to you about the differences of uh, chocolate and uh, roasted uh, on a couple of other things in here, this is the same thing. Chocolate uh, in the chocolate rye, it's going to be a lot softer than it is in the roasted rye. You are actually going to pick out a little bit of rye uh, fruitiness. It's not going to be the same thing as the chocolate wheat. It's going to be very much more subdued on that. And you're going to have a lot more uh, spiciness coming off of it. But this uh, it is still a very aggressive malt, uh, especially compared to other chocolate malts. Being rye, it's aggressive. But uh, I actually like this. It's, uh, it's not quite mulling spices, but it gives you that impression of that deep apple cider with some of those spices in there. A little bit more aggressive and a little bit more peppery than, say, a traditional mulling spice would. But you still have a lot of those good warming spices. Uh, not quite cardamom, but along those lines of uh, earthy spices. It's a it's a really awesome malt that should be used more. Uh, in all honesty, doing a dark saison chocolate rye, oh, yeah. like needs to go in there. Uh, if you want to add a little bit more um, layer complexity to something like a Dortmunder, or sorry, not Dortmunder, I got that so wrong. Dusseldorf Alt or an alt beer. I mean, rye is a great thing to add in there anyway, but a touch of chocolate rye for color is that gonna be this? delicious, in my opinion, anyway. Um, someone's asking what happened to Logan. Uh, for the last time, I swear he has not been kidnapped. He is not being held captive, and we definitely don't have him locked up in a cage somewhere underneath the building. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, that, that's an, that doesn't happen. No, it's definitely not. Currently not. Oh! No, it's, it's not. He's not there. Did, like, did you remember to lock it today? <laughs> I don't. I yes, I did. Um, yeah. So, mm. uh, Kara rye. Somebody mentioned a uh, Kara rye in here. Uh, oh, what percentage of rye would you use uh, min-max? That's actually a great question for both of these malts. Uh, it kind of depends on your beer, but in all honesty, for both of these, I think about a 5% max is mm. is pushing it i mean that's gonna be that'll, that'll be pretty aggressive yeah uh on a on average if it's going for like a little bit of browning a little bit of like color adjustment probably two percent um mm -hmm. three percent would be good to make it like the entire thing a porter kind of range um yeah. five percent would be aggressive you'd be able to you'd, you'd yeah. be able to taste it and feel it as a technique on your or um a feeling on feel your tongue texture yeah i if you five percent would probably be something that's going to be a little bit more aggressive uh, and or funky like a dark saison um, 
if you had or maybe even uh, going for like a quad I wouldn't do that with a roasted rye uh, or a Belgian strong dark something that's gonna have a lot of sugar left over in it you could probably get away with that 5% but keep it low for both of these malts keep it low um, let's go on to kind of the OG debittered malts. Uh, they're, they're not always debittered. There's a, or the, there's a dehusk and a not dehusk version of these. Uh, but Carafa mm -hmm. 1, 2, and 3 are Weirman's kind of response to having a less uh, flavor intense roast malt uh, to the repertoire. So Carafa 1 comes in at, I want to say, like 350. Yeah. Uh, and then Carafa 2 is about 425. Yeah. And then Carafa 3 is about 525. Yes. Uh, and these uh, these are my favorite dark malts to use out there. I love Carafas uh, because you get the exact color that you want out of it without going too aggressive. And you can compensate that for that with some roasted malts or chocolate malts to achieve all of your roasty bitterness. But personally, I don't really like smokiness in my stouts that comes from black malt. If you're making a uh, smoked stout or a smoked porter with appropriately portioned smoked, malts i'll say that i love them they're delicious but when you start when it fe almost feels like there's coal smoke in there i'm out i don't like that from black malt so carafa is it the carafa is for me i love that in stout so yeah. i love that and it's got all the flavor behind all the roast malts too so it's got everything that is not just that uh that astringent bitterness it doesn't have that burnt cup of coffee flavor it's got all the all the richness uh, of a dark malt though. So it, it tastes like roasted barley, it tastes like black malt, uh, but it doesn't have that uh, that extra aggression. Yeah, and, and that that's the best way to put it. It is not aggressive on there because you don't have the extra tannins coming from the holes on that, the extra smokiness, the extra acid that comes from those things. Which is, for my again, for my taste buds, is really good for most beers. Sometimes that's not appropriate. Sometimes you really do need the dark aggressiveness of a black malt. But if you find that uh, your stouts tend to be a little bit too aggressive, switch over to a Carafa. See what happens. Try it out. I dare you. I double, triple dog dare you. Also to throw in on this, Carafa actually does uh, add all three levels, add huge amounts of redness to the beer deep deep garnet red color so if, uh, you're having trouble achieving a red color in uh, a lot of your beers this is a great thing to add very small proportions uh, to those beers and get some good red color coming out of it like an ounce or two yeah uh, not much at all i mean a very small percentage yep you're aiming for color not for flavor um, let's go on to the last one that I have here, which is kind of a, a hybrid. It's in between. Sometimes, depending on who makes it, it's gonna come. It's gonna come in as a roast malt, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's gonna come in as a like a biscuit type malt. Um, but brown malt, there are some companies that make brown malt like a roast malt. Uh, basically, they will set uh, send wet barley into the kiln and high temp kil kiln it for just a much shorter amount of time. Um, so brown malt can also fit into that category. Uh, brown malt is going to give you some nuttiness and some astringency depending on the brown malt that you use. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, like, it's like a baby roast malt. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to see a video about that, go find our video on uh, brown malt three different ways. Yeah. Same and beer with three different uh, brown malts used. Yeah, so yeah. You'll actually see that. We had some that uh, came out literally base malt and brown malt, and it was a really good porter. Yeah. Uh, definitely that it's crazy it was awesome actually that was a really good porter in all honesty i would make that beer again as a real beer but yeah me too all, all right. right let's uh, switch on to topic number two if you've got any questions on the roast malts that we talked about uh comment them um and then we'll we'll get there thoughts on uh, kale chocolate we already talked about we, kale we chocolate. did talk about it so uh lars uh, after live stream is over we wind back a little bit before this and you'll hear our thoughts on pale chocolate uh kale brewing logan was actually released into the wild um we already knew that he was Bigfoot, so. Yeah, we, we did. Uh, yeah, we call him Genus Squatch, actually. That yeah. is his proper name. Or Baby Squatch. Or Baby Squatch. Baby yeah. Squatch. Gnome Squatch, Squatch sometimes. It yeah. depends. The Lumber Tree Squatch. Squatch if he's up top. Yeah. Gnome Squatch if he's down below. There we go. Yeah. Lumber Sexual Squatch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's true, though. That's, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. Oh, my uh, gosh. I made it to the live stream. Welcome, Eric v Zero Zero. <laughs> uh, yeah all right 
Uh, f actually, that's one you didn't hit on, uh, and it's one I don't have too much experience. Flavor and color from coffee malt. Uh, coffee, coffee malt is actually a pseudo crystal malt. Uh, so it comes in, I've seen it anywhere from 130 to 180 uh, level bond, um, depending on who makes it. Uh, and some people will make it more on the um, caramel malt side, and some people will make it more on the roast side. So it's done kind of both ways. But uh, it does taste very coffee-y. It's got a little bit of that Maillard reaction or Maillard browning in it. Um, so it has a little bit of that biscuit note and actually very little um, raw roast to it. And so uh, coffee malt's an interesting one. But it's a pseudo crystal. It's, it goes in at a lower temperature than most roasted malts. Um, but then they finish it off at a high temperature. So it has some of that roast character. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say probably the color off of that is a little bit more brown than red. Yeah. Um, Closer to kin to brown mm. malts than, say, a carafa. It is a fun one to add to, you know, even just like ambers and small percentages. Just kind of see what you can get off of it, though. Yeah, definitely play around with it and then send us some. All right. Do it. Topic two, um, how yeast adds sweetness to your beer. So there's a couple different ways that this goes, uh, and we wanted to go over this because I feel like it's just a sometimes misunderstood um, conversation topic. Uh, a lot of people think that sweetness is going to be just raw, the amount of sugars that are in beer. Uh, or something, but uh, there's a couple different ways that yeast actually play around uh, with beer, uh, and the first is going to be the residual sugars, but it's a different type of residual sugar. Um, uh, it has to do with the yeast attenuation. Yeah, uh, and that's literally how much sugar yeast leaves in there. This is going to be different for most strains on that. Uh, some of them super attenuate or ferment everything out, and then some of them don't. They leave a lot in there. Like we were talking about, if you uh, toss the ESB strain into a high starting gravity beer, it's going to leave a lot of sugars left over in there. Mm -hmm. um, what, there's a couple different reasons that it does that. Sometimes the yeast is just naturally lazy and it's going to ferment a small percentage of um, sugars that it can physically ferment and other times there are types of sugars that uh, yeast cannot ferment. One of the biggest uh, flipping sugars is called maltotriose. I guess it's technically a starch, um, but maltotriose is a uh, uh, a starch that not all yeasts can eat, but uh, a good percentage of them can. So the biggest thing that's going to on average bring a yeast, for example, from 72% attenuation to 77% attenuation is whether or not it can ferment maltotriose. Yeah, uh, a lot of strains out there, that's actually a uh, good example for this, especially slow strains on that. Uh, French Saison versus Belgian Saison. Belgian Saison is notoriously slow. This sucker will stall out on you for anything. I mean, it just doesn't care. Uh, where French Saison doesn't care about anything else and just eats all of the sugars all the way down. and. I mean literally all of them. That can actually convert its own starches into sugars. It's uh, something called the diastaticus yeast, which is a topic for a uh, different discussion. Uh, that kind of goes with this well, one. So, yeah, I mean, diastaticus bit, yeah. does the opposite of add sweetness, but that is another way that uh, uh, choosing your yeast can control the level of sweetness that a beer has. So yeasts that are diastaticus, they are going to produce their own uh, amyloglucosidase during um, fermentation, and that... Uh, 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 enzyme is going to continue to break down starches in a way that makes it so the yeast have more sugar available for them to eat. So mm -hmm. that can do the opposite add sweetness, but that is definitely in the in the topic range. Well, that's something in there. Be aware of that. If you're trying to create a sweet stout and throw a diastaticus yeast at it, that ain't going to happen. I mean, it's, well, the, the yeast is not going to help that happen. The yeast is going to eat almost all the sugars that are in there. Um, but that can also go with uh, setting things up. If you want your yeast to finish out early, uh, say, and leave a little bit more uh, residual sweetness in there, maybe not having exactly the uh, ideal uh, fermentation environment, fermenting it uh, basically at a lower temperature to make it slower, and then when you reach where you want it to go, dropping it down and uh, basically putting the yeast to sleep. So you have a little bit of alcohol and a little bit more sugars instead of letting it go all the way dry. Um, I will say, oh yeah, you actually have it in the next one. So uh, that's another way to uh, control your attenuation on there and create different varying levels of sweetness. Uh, the next le way the yeast adds sweetness to beer is something that a couple of you have already hit on, um, but that is actually ester production during fermentation. Um, that's basically the yeast making some fruity esters that are going to uh, add the perception of sweetness no matter how dry the beer finishes out. 
Uh, along with the esters, I'm going to say different compounds that the yeast produce as well. French Saison, again, is a, a great example for this. Uh, though French Saison is diastaticus and it <laughs> ferments down so far, uh, it also produces long chain flavor molecules. And what that does is make the uh, beer actually perceive as having a whole lot of body to it. So a French Saison beer can perceive to be a little bit sweeter and thicker than another beer that actually has more sugars into it because of those long chain molecules and the big fullness in your mouth. Um, somebody already mentioned what uh, Imperial Loki, uh, mm -hmm. adding some pineapple notes. Uh, the, those pineapple notes are from ester production, uh, and that adds the, per uh, the perception of sweetness. Another great example of a relatively dry beer that's, con uh, that's always going to perceive sweet is a Weiss beer, um, or Hefeweizen, German style Hefeweizen, um, because it's going to be, uh, there's isoamyl acetate production during fermentation. That's that banana flavor, and that banana ester always comes across as sweet. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, well, I'm not going to include that. I don't know that that comes from yeast. That's a different discussion. But what, uh, the esters do provide things like that. They provide things that kind of trick your brain into a perceived sweetness rather than a full sweetness. A lot of English strains produce fruity flavors coming off of there, and it will be a little bit of banana or green apple flavor, and our brain gets that, hits the receptors, and says, oh, gosh, this must be sweet. And so we think sweet uh, or creating flavors through Maillard reactions. Now you create a caramelized flavor reaction on there that, sorry, Ryan is unpacking something like right behind the camera and it is super distracting. All right, let's start that over. If you're doing, May uh, if you're adding Maillard reactions into your beer, that will actually increase perceived sweetness in there because your brain tastes those caramelized reactions and thinks that they're sweet when there may not actually be as much residual sugars in your beer. Fun fact, when it comes to the Maillard reaction, a lot of people ask uh, how ascorbic acid actually goes about uh, reducing um, the risk of oxidation and making your beer more shelf stable. A lot of that actually is tied to the Maillard reaction uh, and the production of something called reductones, reductone, reductones during the Maillard reaction, um, if you guys were curious at all. Yeah. Uh, Oh, wow, I missed a couple of in there. Do, do, do. So that's one thing you have to be aware of in yeast. If you are using an American ale yeast versus a British ale yeast, even though they might finish out at the same uh, final gravity, the British ale yeast will perceive to be sweeter than the American ale yeast because of the esters that are in it and the ester production. Yeah, and that's a desired flavor. That's why, that's why a lot of uh, uh, British yeasts are, or British beers are... Uh, you missed it. Um, uh, a lot. Why a lot of British beers are generally designed to be served, you know, they're warmer and under cask because you want to uh, express all that sweetness that comes off of the yeast production better. Yeah, and that's why you use British yeast to make cask beers instead of American yeast because it produces all those wonderful flavors to do it. Where American ale yeast is known to be extremely clean, and you know, that's not what you want out of a cask. You want all the delicious num nums. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the very last topic for that is punch, punching children. Punching children, yeah. Punching, that definitely uh, adds sweetness to your beer. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> let's say you get really, really drunk, and then you know a child walks by your house, and you're like, mm, I don't like that child being in front of my house. Uh, you punch him, and then you're like, ah, oh, sweetness. That, that, that is a story right there. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely a story. All right. Uh, so the topic that I was thinking about earlier that we will hit on now, since we are out of the adding sweetness to your beer from yeast, a good way to add a perce perceived sweetness to your beer, even dry beers as well, is carbonation levels. Yeah. Guinness. Guinness is not a sweet beer. It's classified as a dry Irish stout. Generally, even in Guinness, they actually do a Britannomyces fermentation to dry it out the final points. But because of the extra malts that are added in there, as well as the yeast that they normally use to ferment it out with, and the low carbonation, it is perceived as being very, very sweet. So if you want to adjust a couple of those things, definitely play around with carbonation. That can do a lot too. And you can add in nitrogen uh, nitrogenization nitrogenation 
how do you pronounce that word? Nitrogenizations. Put nitrogen into your beer. Yeah. Um, I've also seen nitrous oxide. Well, that'll do. Yeah. Uh, I've also seen nitrous oxide uh, be one of the additions. Um, oh. Uh, White Claw sponsor us. If you guys know of a rep at White Claw, let them know that we need a sponsorship. Yeah. Um, yeah, so nitrous oxide actually, uh, it comes across it, uh, uh, when it's uh, released from the beer on your palate. It actually comes across uh, flavor receptor wise, I forget the science behind this, uh, but very similar to an actual sugar. And so nitrous oxide can physically make a beer actually sweeter, whereas uh, nitrogen actually just does that by softening the beer and adding a roundness to the texture. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go grab a beer for us to drink because we owe it to this gentleman. We 100% drank the wrong beer for the ice box, so we are going to drink the right beer now. That was uh, my fault. Yeah. That was a combined effort. Um, uh, in the meantime, if you guys got any questions, I'm going to go through some that we've already had. Uh, general topic question, looking at a pumpkin lager in the fall and I'm going to use a base Martzen. Add pumpkin to mash. Question is, should I use pumpkin spices? And if so, end of boil. Uh, be very, very sparing with pumpkin spices. That's the flavor of pumpkin beer. Most pumpkin beers, you can't actually taste the pumpkin itself. Um, I like to buy pre-made pumpkin pie filling and use a little bit of that because it's got some spices in it already. Um, also, it has some salt, and that salt gives the perception of sweetness to your beer as well. Um, but my favorite, favorite way to make the pumpkin beer flavor more pumpkin-y is actually to add sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are delicious and they have more uh, flavor that actually ends up in the final beer than pumpkin itself does. So that's kind of my, my, my trick there. Yeah, uh, I will also say on pumpkin beers, cook yeah, pumpkin. P cook like, your pumpkin. Actually cook your pumpkin. If you're using real pumpkin, roast that sucker because it's going to caramelize the sugars in the oven or create a Maillard reaction, and then you're going to get more flavor out of it. Um, I also do that with, uh, if I add actually pre-canned pumpkin pie mix to it, you're just getting the mashed up pumpkin. Put it into a pie dish and then try and create little waves or mounds in there and cook the sucker until you get some good Maillard reactions going on and that will actually add more flavor to it or just you know use sweet potatoes and get more flavor. Um, someone's uh, asking about adding amyloglucosidase products like uh, Aromazyme um, to chop down hop compounds and hazies. Um, usually uh, if you're adding an actual AMG it's going to um, uh, continue to dry out the beer so it's not going to add the perception of sweetness. Uh, aromazyme, I don't know if that's an AMG actually. Uh, uh, the enzyme that per, that the enzyme that cleaves um, uh, hop compounds is a, uh, what's the, the word where you, you kick off a water, uh, you kick off a water molecule when you cleave it, you chop it in half and a water molecule comes out. It's hydrolysis. Yeah, so hi it's a hydrolysis enzyme whereas AMG is not um, doesn't act through hydrolysis and so I believe those are two different enzymes but I could be wrong um, but uh, AMG will continue to break down starches and it will uh, dry out your beer so do, doing the opposite of adding sweetness uh, back to the new glaris topic if I were to make some time to travel to me would you be able to return the package with halcyon in it yes uh, yeah yeah for Probably. sure Probably. definitely uh, Scott uh, Crosby um, do it yeah, he's, he's saying one of these days he's going to chuck a Costco pumpkin pie into the mash tun and see what happens. Um, it's delicious is what happens in all honesty. I've done it before. Uh, not a Costco one. Uh, when I used to make my um, actually pumpkin beers at home, I would literally make a pumpkin pie and chuck it in the mash. Now, chucking it in the mash is a little bit dangerous because it's going to gum that sucker up. So do make sure you have a butt ton of uh, rice holes and I literally mean a metric butt ton I think it's 128 gallons yeah uh, so you should have like probably four volumes of rice holes per volume of apple pie pumpkin pie yeah uh, apple, and apple pie Throw well it all apple in there. pie would be uh, it's not quite as gooey so you could get away with a little less on that one that's true. but it definitely makes a, this is actually what I was talking about cooking your pumpkin it creates different flavors when you cook it so if you're using real pumpkin, cook it for better pumpkin beer flavor. But apple pie also a great substitute if you haven't seen your girlfriend for a while. So, right. uh, would that be McDonald's apple pie or fresh apple pie? Uh, I think you got to go fresh. Definitely fresh. Yeah. And you got to cook it in a silicone <laughs> a silicone pan. 
That that makes it better. That All is, right. Uh, that is real. Um. Yeah, that is real. All right. So let's. Do you have uh, any videos on using copper a copper pot for the boil? Uh, we don't. We've actually never used a copper pot. Um, copper pot obviously used commonly in distilling, and it's used in a lot of old school uh, old school breweries. The nice thing about using copper during uh, any sort of brewing or sp especially distillation process, it is actually pulls out sulfurs as well. So, mm -hmm. um, one but thing yeah, it's highly heat conductive, and that's about all I uh, I know about it. One thing to uh, realize about copper, though, is you need to keep it extremely clean. Uh, if you see black oxidation on there, um, that stuff is not very good for you, but it comes off really well. Uh, the actual rust, the copper oxide on there that's green, that stuff is poisonous. And do not put liquid you are going to drink on top of it. Clean it off first. Get some nice acid is on it. Uh, definitely. Co copper is a little bit more difficult to work with than so stainless steel just because of that fact. And not to work with. Copper is a little bit more difficult to use because it needs to, it's harder to keep as clean as stainless steel. But it's a great product and we used it for a long, long, long time to make beer. So Long time. There we go. Or two McDonald's apple pies and a sock. That's a good, because then mm. if you... Yeah, no, that could, yeah. Yeah, that could work. But, um, you might need actually maybe two socks to keep it all the way in there, though. But I would also suggest like beating the sock first to mash up the apple pie on the inside. Mm. Mm. We're on to something. We're on to something. Um, uh, greetings from Hungary. Uh, Mickey Gasper wants to brew a Belgian double, and I only have access to really dark, uh, i.e. 230 SRM candy sugar. Should I be concerned about creating burnt oh, yeah. flavors if I add too much? Yes, you should. Uh, I was looking for your comment earlier. Uh, depending on when you add them in, I will add that caveat. So if you're adding your uh, sugars in at the very end of the boil, where you know you're, they're not in there long enough to burn, no. Uh, well, if you did it, if you did it like a, uh, if you're only adding like a half a kilo or a, a pound of candy sugar, then I think it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty fine. But if you add a lot of it, it does have a little bit of like a roasty mm. kind of flavor. Yeah. So I would, I would, if you're adding, depending on how much you're adding, I would maybe consider cutting it with like beet sugar or even just dextrose or mm. cane sugar or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the already dark candy sugar has been boiled down and caramelized a little bit. Uh, so it does already have Maillard reactions. You don't want to boil that stuff for too long if you can help it. Unless you are literally trying to do if you're trying to make molasses or caramel out of some work then yeah do that uh but dark candy sugar should normally go in towards the end to avoid the scorching and the extra caramelization from it uh ko brooding should the mash ph be on the higher side for sweet stouts is it okay to raise raise the sodium levels uh, by using sodium bicarbonate yes that is totally okay to use some um baking soda uh uh, in terms of the mass pH, though, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't play around with the mash pH. I'm always going to be adjusting my sweetness with my grist, uh, changing, you know, my level of if I'm adding special X or if I'm adding a lot of uh, flaked oats or something like that. I'm going to eliminate as many variables and try to keep my mash pH consistent batch to batch. And so you can use the sodium uh, bicarbonate to raise your mash pH a little bit, um, but that also, you know, you still want to aim for that 5.2, just knowing that the uh, extra roast malts in your stout are going to lower your mash pH. So um, good question. Uh, I would also consider uh, when I want sodium and chloride in my beer, I just add salt. So yeah. That's how I adjust those. All right. uh, I don't remember who it was, but somebody had a question about vinyl earlier. They got an infected uh, beer, and they they thought it came from their lines and how to clean that. The, if you have an infect, infection in any porous surface, the best and in my recommendation, pretty much only way to clean or use it for clean beers afterwards is to boil. If you cannot boil it, replace it. Vinyl lines are cheap, and don't risk your beer over vinyl lines. Just replace that stuff. Uh, if it's porous and you can boil it, boil it, and you're probably good. Not much can survive. Not much that will ruin beer can survive through boiling. So. Uh, Aaron Welch, really good question. When dry hopping, is it better to pull the beer off the yeast cake before dry hopping? Uh, C. Taz Michael pretty much already answered this. Uh, the yeast cake is not going to risk anything, um, and it's better to keep it in one vessel if you can. If you have really fancy equipment, you can go ahead and, and transfer it, do a Lodo transfer, uh, uh, completely 
closed system transfer. Um, in which case, I usually, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to be dry hopping by actually running the beer through some sort of a filtering mechanism that goes over the hops so that I maximize that contact time. But if you're just in a situation where you're going to be opening your fermenter, your keg, and adding the hops and then closing it back up, um, don't. Just uh, dry hop in primary. If, you're, if it's a hazy beer, go ahead and dry hop during active fermentation in primary. That way you're double kind of getting rid of the, uh, the oxygen at that time. Yeah. Uh, I would say our advice is to almost never rack into a secondary unless there is a specific reason for it. Your beer, most homebrew beers, most standard beers are not going to sit on a yeast cake long enough to be detrimental. Uh, all you're doing when you're doing a secondary racking is opening your beer up to oxidation and infection. Now, if you're doing a long aging beer, then yes, get it off that yeast cake because that will actually have some negative uh, effects onto it. But that's like months. Um, the only time that uh, autolysis is the, the risky flavor that people are usually concerned about. Um, the only time autolysis is going to be an issue within a like a five week period or a normal fermentation period is if you have crazy temperature swings like 70 to 90 and back to 70. Um, that can uh, risk autolysis, but that's obviously usually not going to happen unless you're using quike or saison strains and those yeasts are really, really hardy. So they are not going to explode. And so either way, it's not a risk. Yeah. The, don't risk your beer. Don't risk something that you've worked so hard for and it's going to be delicious just because the internet told you to do it on information that was like 30 years old when we didn't fully understand what was happening. Now, if the internet tells you to do something like take two McDonald's apple pies and shove them into a sock, do it. that is something you should do. That, that is something you'll have fun doing. <laughs> Literally. Uh, Can we turn but, this into a mims? Somebody uh, make us a shirt out there that uh, has that. Has that. Uh, yes, definitely has that in there. Um, all right. So let's get into this beer real quick. Uh, this is this is something that we tried to do last time, but we couldn't find the right beer because we didn't use our baby eyes. This is a really nice ice box. I will say yeah. uh, it's not traditional. He is right. This is not a traditional ice box. Uh, I, it does have some beautiful, beautiful Maillard reaction going on in there. It is a gorgeous red color. Um, it does have some of those really concentrated notes, different alcohol notes and different flavor notes coming off from the eyes prod, uh, process. I like that. There's also some yeast fruitiness that I'm really enjoying and that yeast fruitiness is, I feel like, even more concentrated uh, or being pushed more forward from the alcohol uh, being concentrated as well. The one thing that I would say is a little bit out of character for the style is there is a subtle amount of roast notes to this. So it does have a little bit of that uh, extra aggression from, from roastiness. Um, but all in all, it's, it's, it's a really good beer. Yeah, definitely really good, really enjoyable on this. Um, I don't know. I would love to have tasted it before the icing process as well. I enjoy this a lot. Yeah, I feel like it might have been uh, probably tasted young before the icing process. That icing process is going to reduce some uh, otherwise harsh notes. So, um, mm. Yeah, I'd probably do it before. There, there's a middle flavor that I think might have been taken out uh, or reduced from the icing process. I get some really good deep flavors on the palate, some really good high notes. There's just a straight middle flavor of a, a little bit of maltiness that I think that I'm missing. But it's I, awesome. I'm super enjoying this. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh how would we get the beer off the hops if we dry hop in primary? Will it be worried about the green flavor? Um, so beer off the hops is going to be done through some sort of filtering mechanism when you rack, uh, or just it's going to be crashed out uh, by um, transferring to your keg or bottles. Uh, if you're going into bottles, um, that's going to be more difficult. Um, but doing some sort of, sort of positive pressure cold crash is going to be the easiest way to separate out the beer so that it's easier to rack off everything that's not the hop layer. Um, if you're really worried about the hops or if you don't have a really good system to close transfer, throwing something like so throwing something like a muslin bag over your siphon is going to be a good way to, uh, to clear that out. Yeah. Uh, all right. How do we feel about wooden casks storing beer, either for aging or for serving? Uh, I personally love the idea. I don't think that it's appropriate for every single beer out there. Serving a hazy IPA uh, or storing it in a wooden cask 
depending on the, I guess I should rephrase this, depending on the type of wood. If you're using normal or porous uh, oak, white oak, or other woods, don't do high hoppy beers in this because this is going to oxidize them. One of the reasons for storing things in oak is for the micro oxygenation process. Uh, I love beers that are stored that way. Obviously, history is full of beers that were stored this way since we didn't have another way to store them or serve them for a long time. Just do keep in mind that, uh, no, especially white oak, but most woods will have an oxidative process going on in there. And you need to be aware of that either to have it gone before harmful effects happen or serve it when good effects happen. If you have a Belgian strong ale and you get that nice oxidized sherry flavor going on in there, that is amazing. But it takes a while to get out of it or to get that. I'm very glad that our new mill does not have a loudness like our old mill. Oh, yeah. It's so um, nice and sexy. Lars, could I leave uh, cryo hops on the beer longer without negative effects? I'm thinking seven to ten days. Uh, I would always recommend three to five days as your dry hop time, not just because of the potential risk of oxidation uh, or not risking the, uh, the grassiness that you would get off of using uh, let's say pellet hops, uh, but you actually express the yeast in a more, or the hops in a more pungent way. So they're usually punchier and sharper um, with a shorter dry hop time. Uh, that is dependent on actual contact um, with the hops. And so you want to make sure that there's a good contact with the hops and they're not just like, if they're in a bag or a, uh, one of those hop screens that you dry hop with, then it's going to take a lot longer time or you're not going to get that full effect off of dry hopping with those versus if you have them loosely in your fermenter uh, while it's activated or while it's moving. Or um, with the inline uh, uh, thing that I mentioned before, if you're actually like running your beer over your hops. Like a hop rocket. Yeah. Uh, just to go on, if the apple pie method will not work for you because of anatomy issues, like being a girl, use a flute. Yep, that is also uh, <laughs> important. Keeping on the uh, same theme of that. Uh, all right. Let's see. Where did... Uh Sweating and sanitizing uh, new oak barrels. Okay, well, okay, that's not something we're going to do in the barrel video, but um, I can mention that really quick. Sweating and sanitizing new oak barrels. New oak is not sanitary. Oak loves to carry a whole bunch of different yeast and bacteria on it everywhere. Um, and I guess I shouldn't say new oak isn't sanitary. If they sulfur bombed it, it's sanitary on the inside. Sulfur and seal, yes, sanitary but you also need to wash that out too. So uh, sweating is basically a process of pumping steam in there to make the sure that it's fully sealed. That will be in the uh, video. So will sanitizing, but we will be talking about used oak barrels. Same thing applies to new oak barrels, so stay tuned for that one. Uh, See, Taz McDaniel has a flute. So oh yeah. I think our bases are covered. There we go. Uh, like. Gosh, I mean, <laughs> that movie of a generation. Uh, All right, let's try to get one anyway. more question in before we open up. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we got, what, five, we, four we, minutes left? Yeah, we've got some people asking about uh, yeast starters. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Someone mentioned doing a yeast starter or a double pitch at 1060 or above. Um, that's, yeah, that's about where I say, too. 1060 or above is definitely do it we always recommend yeast starters no matter what the you know uh, the og of the beer is or the alcohol percentage of the beer is going to be um because it's going to be a consistent rip uh and your yeast net doesn't always come you know packaged in a consistent way so it's not always the amount of uh yeast that you're after that you think it's going to be in there having yeah. nice healthy yeast going into your beer already awake and in the fermentation process is always going to be better than just tossing a packet in most of these packets are made to be tossed in it's 100 percent okay but it's kind of one of those things if somebody literally just takes your bed and dumps you out of it into a pile of steaks it's going to take you a while to wake up and start eating or if you've already got up got showered got dressed and then walked into a room full of steak you just get after it you know i want steak now I kind of want to, yeah. Green? I kind of want to be woken up that way, though. Like just dumped into a pile of steak. Yeah, that I'm assuming delicious. it's like well cooked, medium rare to rare. Maybe some nice uh, tier on the outside. Wagyu. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. or if it's dry aged, I could do. Oh yeah, some of that. butter aged. 
but <laughs> yeah. yeah i've yeah. seen that oh oh all right all right what were we talking about uh so uh Is this a beer and, channel yeah <laughs> anyway um that's something that we always recommend is yeast starters above 1060 double pitch if you don't want to yeast start or yeast start Aaron Cox, I like this. Never made a sour beer before. Looking into using Philly Sour because it's easier than regular. Um, oh, I didn't read the rest of it. Philly, I was going to talk about Philly Sour. So a simple recipe to get you started on your sour journey is literally just a Hefeweizen recipe. Half uh, Pilsner malt, half wheat malt, and a little bit of acid malt. A little bit of acid malt. Away you go. V extremely little to actually no hops in there. Uh, so Philly Sour. If you guys haven't heard of that yet, Philly Sour is a Saccharomyces strain that produces lactic acid. So this is not a wild, this is not a bacteria, this is not Brett, this is sat. This is your normal yeast that produces some lactic acid bacteria and you can get some really nice sour beers, just a normal fermentation. Uh, it is different from your normal souring process. It produces acid in different ways, so you do kind of need to be aware of that. But mostly, I mean, if you want an easy recipe, literally just pretty much 50-50 Pilsner to wheat, a little bit of acid malt, chuck this sucker on it, let it warm, ferment, and away you go. Uh, that's going to create a wonderful sour. And for people out there that are worried about infections, look at this Philly sour yeast. Get into some sour beers. It's awesome. Uh, Hendrik, Hendrik Potgeger, Potgeter. Um, can I send you beer? Uh, I didn't read the rest of that comment, but you had, yes. you had me at that. Oh, from South Africa. Yes, please. From South Africa. I just, yeah, I didn't read yeah. the rest of it. I mean, send us beer. But you can stop there. Send us beer. But it would be <laughs> really cool to uh, see some beer from South Africa. Any any comment that starts with, can I send you beer, the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Um, um, somebody, where's another good question? Uh, okay, adding a stave, any treatment needed or just drop it in? I would 100% treat any wood that you add into your beer unless it is a wild or mixed fermented beer or you're trying to purposely infect it. it uh, wood, especially Britanniomyces, loves to live in wood. A lot of these bacteria and yeast can actually eat wood sugar and survive in there. You don't know what happened to that piece of wood before it got to your place, so just sanitize, sterilize it first. Hot water works. Liquor is beautiful on there. Pouring any uh, high proof alcohol onto it uh, sanitizes, sterilizes amazingly. So, Garrett Ray is Logan part of Genus anymore? Uh, I haven't seen him in a while, but I heard he's banging Stifler's mom. <laughs> yes, I think he's taking that tour around right now. Uh, <laughs> how far can we go? With this? Uh, Glucosate enzyme for dry hop. Do you notice the difference? Do you use it with fruit beers? Um, uh, we don't use it for fruit beers. Pretty much we only use uh, glucosidase uh, during fermentation for brute IPAs or high alcohol beers. Uh, other than that, we're going to take all of our enzyme cleavage, um, uh, uh, mash, mash. Si mash side. Um, there are natural enzymes or natural producing uh, ways to uh, cleave hops. Um, depending on the yeast you use, but most yeast can actually do that biotransformation cleaving of, of hops to express the aromatics. Yeah, I, I would say that, yes, you could get a better biotransformation if you add extra enzymes in there because that's going to help out the process. But do keep in mind that those enzymes are going to do more than just the biotransformation. So if you're not making a brute or a really dry IPA, adding those enzymes may not be the best idea. And they're probably not gonna make it hazy. They're gonna make it the opposite of hazy. Yeah. Uh, the Pix Brothers, I want to send you beer from the south of France. What do you oh, think? Oh, God, yes. French triple, new style. Yeah. I'm I, in, I'm all in. That I sounds fantastic. I will admit this, I love French beer. If you guys have not been able to get a hold of French beer, get some. Uh, obviously, they are, uh, Wine is the biggest thing as far as booze to be known to come out of France. But, oh, man, uh, sorry, I'm just thinking about it. A lot of the time they're applying the same fine, awesome techniques that go into their wine production as it goes into the beer production. A lot of the French beer that I've had hasn't been big, wild beers, but I absolutely love them. Uh, I can't remember the name because it's French. Uh, but there's a uh, farmhouse brewery in Avignon that 
I I don't know. Somebody gave me like a case of it, and I it's my precious. I hoard it like Gollum, my goddamn <laughs> precious. Beer to guard is one of my favorite styles too. Like say yes, send us beer, please. All right. um, Eric Mohelm, hope you guys received the HLH brews I sent you. Uh, we did receive a package of beers this last week. Was that the one that had the the, the carton stuff, the the cardboardy things around it? Yeah. We got a note with it. We did get a note with it, I think. So I'm hoping so too. Yes. And again, we hit on this last week. Like, I send notes with your beers, and um, yeah. Labels. Please, please label them. Even though this one was labeled, we still had trouble finding it because reasons so make them clear for us uh all right <laughs> nice yeah that is yours okay yeah. so hopefully okay. we'll be able to get into those beers next week yeah um uh, yeah oh oh man there we go uh anything else any other questions before we have ryan shut off the stream uh let's see road trip in june you're stopping by uh i'm just going through i uh Oh, Road Trip and Junior, want to stop by? Yeah, can't wait to see the store. Uh, See Taz McDaniel, can't wait for you to see the store as well. Uh, It's, I mean, honestly, it's a lot less whelming. Less whelming is the thing, right? Than you'd probably expect. Uh, We started this with probably, we probably have the least expensive startup cost of any brewery in Spokane by a big margin. By by a huge margin. Um, I actually, probably almost by any margin. I want to Precious say we've, we've, things may be the only person who spent less money on their setup because they already had the land. I think we've spent more on our camera and YouTube equipment than we have uh, on like the majority of our store. That actually is 100% true. There are two of them right here that cost more than almost everything in this store. Yeah, you can start a whole business. <laughs> you can start a whole business with with the amount of money that we put in ju- into just the camera equipment. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, sweet. So, uh, so Ryan is about to go and shut off the stream. So uh, make sure before he does that, that you guys are all subscribed to the channel. Um, subscribe to our second channel, Genus Not Brewing. That is where we will be publishing our Will It Beer series. That is a challenge where you you, you get a mystery basket of ingredients and have to make strange beer out of it. Um, that's, those are all going to be going on our hashtag White Cloud sponsor us. I just saw that. <laughs> yeah. um, those will all be going on our second channel from now on because that's going to be our more entertainment content. Um, thank you for watching smash that like button thanks count drunkula uh appreciate yeah. you guys all hanging out with us for an hour and a little bit and uh we'll see you next week 8 45 here going and uh we'll be talking about beer yeah. follow all our stuffs <laughs>